This is a paper that's done with uh, Thomas Seeger uh, here from Arizona State University and our colleague Daniel Eisenberg, who's now at the Naval Postgraduate School. So uh, our paper was in response to a call for special papers on resilience analytics, and it started with this paper that appeared a couple years ago that introduced this idea of resilience analytics, and that is the use of data-driven machine learning types of techniques to visualize, design, and manage interdependent infrastructures to make them more resilient. And it talks about, in that paper, about using different kinds of network models, interdependent, to develop both descriptive, prescriptive, and predictive kind of analytics, the kind of things that we know and love uh, in the SRA and operations research communities. And if you read through some of these papers, a lot of what you see in them is that it's sort of like, Twitter feeds and machine learning models are going to give us more resilience. And it was at this point where we were like, maybe not so much. But to understand this, we have to sort of unpack it, and that's what I'm going to try to do about what it is that we're doing. So I want to start off by drawing a little cartoon about how big data analytics are intended to work. And so we have the world, which is a very complicated system that we want to represent, and we have a model of that world. Here it's a circle as opposed to just the real thing. We've abstracted away lots of different uh, aspects of it, and we use big data, that is data in large volume, velocity, and variety, and we build a bunch of analytics around this model in order to generate decision support aids for a user. And that user has some goals, again, to describe, predict, or prescribe some courses of action. Now it's important to recognize that this user has a particular frame of reference that's influenced by their background beliefs, biases, and other kinds of things that cognitively go into the way they want to try to manage the world. But, uh, so the user then uses that model, queries the model, in order to then ultimately take action onto the world, and the idea is that by taking action on the world, things change, we get new data, we have this nice feedback mechanism, and in this context, we can learn about how to make better decisions uh, to support the kinds of uh, goals that the user has. Now this story is incomplete because it leaves out the role of the modeler. Right? And the modeler is the one who's building the model in the first place. And it's important to, represent, to recognize that the modeler has their own frame of reference, their own background beliefs and biases, and their own goals right? to describe, predict, and prescribe. And so in fact, uh, what's really important in this context is the communication and alignment of goals between the modeler and the user. Many famous analytics sort of efforts failed because the modeler and the user weren't really talking the same language, or were using the same language but talking past each other in some way. But if done correctly, right, the modeler and the user work together and this uh, feedback loop works great. At least that's how it's supposed to work. Of course, there are things that go wrong, and the things that we go wrong we want to talk about in the form of surprise. Right? So cognitive scientists talk about surprise, and when they talk about surprise, they distinguish between two different types. They talk about what's called situational surprise as opposed to fundamental surprise. And they're different, and I want to contrast them because the difference matters in the context of this story. So situational surprise is maybe something that's unexpected, but it's compatible with your previous beliefs. In contrast to that, fundamental surprise refutes basic beliefs about how things work requires you to rethink the way that the world around you is actually working. And there are consequences of this, right? So in situational surprise, failures in system responses are well modeled, right? Your systems, your model's been parameterized to deal with these unexpected types of things, where in contrast, you can't define in advance the things that you have to pay attention to fundamental surprise, so your model hasn't necessarily been parameterized to deal with it. And as a result, situational surprise can be averted or mitigated by information about the future, whereas, in fact, advanced information about the future causes the fundamental surprise when it actually happens. And as a result, learning from situational surprise seems easy, whereas learning from fundamental surprise is much more difficult. Right? So to make this a little bit more concrete, uh, the example that we like to use is that of these uh, lotteries, right? Mega millions, multiplier, right? Win a billion dollars kinds of things. Our normal experience with this, normal variation in this context is that we buy a ticket and we lose. Right? That's our normal experience, we go, we buy, right? But every now and again, and actually every time someone wins, there's somebody who buys a ticket and wins, right? Uh, that's a very unexpected kind of thing, right? One in a gazillion that you're actually the winner, right? 
Fundamental surprise in this context might be you don't buy a ticket. <laughs> Right? So if that were to happen to you, you would have to sort of rethink like what actually happened here. That thing that I clicked on on Facebook actually entered me in a thing that then was right. You have to retrace and sort of reframe the way in which the world actually works. And so this is the context in which we have to deal with and consider fundamental surprise. Now, so this cartoon that I painted here is useful for thinking about both situational and fundamental surprise. Because the feedback loop that involves big data can deal with situational surprise. You have things that are well modeled but may be very rare. You can account for them and your model can learn. It can update its priors about what the likelihood of this thing happening in the future is. So that's well represented here. In contrast, fundamental surprise is about a different kind of feedback. Feedback that's going to either the user or the modeler that is changing their frame of reference or how the world works. And the key idea here is that there is no inherent mechanism to inform this data-driven analytics. This has to come through the user. It has to come through the model. And so this now allows us to think about, well, in the presence of this sort of fundamental surprise, how do the modeler and the user deal with it? Well, the ideal situation is that the modeler and the user are both present, and they can work together to deal with this in some way. Here's a, a concrete example of something that happened. It was Hurricane Ophelia that, according to uh, the Meteorological Service in Ireland, took a very weird trajectory, right? It headed toward the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, what you see here on the left is a picture from uh, NOAA in terms of the forecasted winds. And what you can see is this very strange uh, uh, break in the model because no one ever thought that a storm could go that far north or over the prime meridian, right? And so, uh, so there it is. There's your analytic model, right? There's the fundamental surprise. 12 hours later, we see that this has been fixed, right? The user and the modeler got together and said, whoa, this is not going to help us, uh, but we're able to adjust. We're able to improvise, right? So that's the situation uh, uh, when they're both there and working together. But what happens if one or the other of these two are not available? So in particular, what happens when the modeler is not there, right? If the modeler is not there in the presence of fundamental surprise, the user is now limited in the kinds of actions that they can take. They may try to query the model, but in the end, they have to improvise. The model's not giving them what they need, right? And they have to find some other way of figuring it out. Uh, these kinds of things can and do happen. Uh, this is something that happened in the Oroville Dam in Northern California, February 2017 where the largest dam in the United States almost collapsed. Uh, large amounts of rain led to a situation where uh, they were letting water out of the Oroville Dam, and the primary spillway shown here started to fail. And, uh, and as that started to happen, the hillside started to erode, to the point where the geologist on site said, in 45 minutes, this dam is going to collapse. And at that point, two engineers at the top of this primary spillway, which had already failed, said, I don't know, we gotta do something. So they opened those gates to a level never before seen that caused tremendous damage to the spillway but ultimately saved the dam. Right? It was in the presence of this fundamental surprise that they had to make a decision. They had to improvise. Right? There was no model to support that. Okay, so, uh, so what happens then in contrast when the user's not there? Right? We see this a lot in automated systems. We're doing a lot of automation particularly in systems that have to move at speeds for which users cannot be making decisions. Um, this happens in financial systems. It also happens in critical infrastructure and electric power systems. And, uh, and when fundamental surprise occurs, now the question is, how does the modeler deal with this? And one of the things in particular that might happen is that the modeler might be too slow to adapt this online model that is doing things. Right? We see this in financial systems where there are crashes, uh, we also see it in the context of uh, critical infrastructure systems. So there was a power outage in San Diego uh, in 2011 that essentially uh, there was a relay that was set to the wrong tolerances. It tripped when it shouldn't have, and then this led to a cascading type of event, and the, the uh, operators were just too slow to adapt in this presence. Right? Um, so, uh, okay, so... Uh, User modeler, we're limited in what we can do. The real scary thing is what happens when they both go away? Right? Well, what happens when the modeler is gone? What happens when the user is gone? We're quickly moving into this world. Right? So this is LeBron James sitting in the back of an autonomous vehicle. Right? 
uh, what happens uh, when there is no modeler, when there is no user, right? We are just all passengers along for the ride. This is where it gets really scary and dangerous. And so this is where we really think that we, that, that we, we argue we need to rethink resilience analytics. And this little cartoon, this little fr framework with these two little feedback loops would provide, we think, some context for doing this. So in particular, um, if we think about, again, whether the modeler is present or absent, or whether the user is present or absent, we can uh, categorize, we can list out the different types of corrective actions we might take. So as mentioned before, when both the modeler and the user are there, we have this opportunity for collective improvisation. Right? They can work together to adjust, to improvise in the presence of this fundamental surprise. But this improvisation has to be practiced. There have to be protocols for dealing with it. You can't just figure it out on the fly. This is where drilling is really important. Right? Rehearsing exercises is really important. Um, and just because the user and the uh, modeler are there doesn't mean that they're going to work well, right? They could work at cross purposes with one another, particularly if they haven't rehearsed. But this is sort of the best case in terms of the options that we have. As mentioned, when the uh, user is present and the modeler is absent, well, the user is limited in what they can do. They can ask questions of the model. They can try to augment the model in some way, but more often than not, what they're going to have to do is maybe abandon the model and use some kind of decision heuristics right, to try to figure out what it is to do until a later point at which that model can be updated. Uh, accordingly, what happens when the user uh, is absent but the modeler is there? Well, the modeler has some choices, right? They can try to override the model, they can roll back the model, they can kludge the model, they can try to fix it. The challenge there is just the time scale and the speed at which they can do this, get it tested, get it deployed. Um, before they, uh, before they actually have to take action. And then the final situation is what happens when both the user and uh, the model are, are absent. And this is where a real systems design becomes important. Right? To what extent can we design systems that fail safe or are safe to fail? Right? They've been designed in a way so that when they fail, they fail in particular ways so that there is damage, but that damage is mitigated. We see this in floodplains and other kinds of things where these sort of decisions are made up front. And the whole idea is to do this to try to avoid cascade and catastrophe. So again, we think that this framework, although simple, helps us to understand the ways in which we might start to deal with uh, surprise and re requires that we rethink resilience analytics. So as noted, uh, the paper came out in the fall special issue. And I'll thank you for your attention. And take any, one quick question if you have time.